and that's okay. the official thing. So um, welcome everybody to the world building panel. Um, how much world building is too much? And I'm Bob Angel, I'm your moderator, and um, we'll, we'll do a round of uh, introductions by everybody and then get going. So um, I guess I should introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm a queer writer with background in physics, semiconductors business, a partial MFA, blah, blah, blah. I've been publishing since 1997. My first novel, Best Bay Game Ever, came out in 2019 and draws from my experience in early virtual reality work. Um, most of my work has some queer content like my Asimov's Deep Space Colony Ship story in the space of nine lives. Um, and um, yeah, I can, I will start the trend by putting my links into the chat um, for people to grab if they'd like. And, uh, and we'll, we'll move on. So how about um, Monica? Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Luzon. I'm a writer, editor. Uh, I am a querying editor at The Dread Machine, and I'll put a link to the chat in there. We have an anthology call that closes tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. for stories themed with uh, security, identity, and or community. And um, I'm on this panel, I think, because I have written a novel uh, with some pretty complex world building. It's currently in the editing beta reading stage. And uh, Joshua. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Joshua Palmatier. I'm an epic fantasy author with Daw Books. Uh, my first series was the Throne of Amoncore series, which you can now get the entire series in one giant fat on the edition. Uh, so, and it's actually pretty cheap on Amazon right now. It's like 12 for the whole thing. So uh, maybe go check that out. Um, I think, though, I'm on this panel because of my most recent series, uh, which begins with uh, Shattering the Lay, okay, um, and in this series, I built a world that uses the ley lines as a power source, kind of like how we use electricity, uh, so it's still an epic fantasy, but it's got a much more uh, modern feel to it, um, so hopefully I'll be able to draw some of that uh, for this particular panel. And in addition to being a fantasy author, I'm also the founder of the small press Zombies Need Brains. Uh, and we publish science fiction and fantasy uh, themed anthologies. Our most re recent ones uh, include apocalyptic, obviously apocalypse stories. Uh, my battery is low and is getting dark. Uh, it's about old tech that uh, finds new life. We wanted to hope for the uh, rovers up on Mars. And the last one's Galactic Stew, so science fiction and fantasy, fantasy stories about food. Um, so go check those out and uh, check out the small press and see what else we got coming up in the near future. Great, thanks. Sarah Beth? Hi, I'm Sarah Beth Thirst. I write fantasy for adults, teens, and kids. Um, my newest one is The Bone Maker. It's about second chances and bone magic. Uh, it's out from Harper Voyager and very excited about it. It was a lot of fun to write. I um, also wrote Race of Sands, which is epic fantasy, also a standalone uh, about monster racing and the Queen Sorinthia series, which is bloodthirsty nature spirits. So I do a lot of world building and I love it so much. So that's why I'm on this panel. Great. And Karen. Hi, um, I'm Karen Osborne. I'm the author of the Memory War series from Tor Books. Um, first one is Architects of Memory, and the second one is Engines of Oblivion. Um, it's a complete story. It's out at your bookstore now. Um, I have to say that, you know, you know. <laughs> anyway, I have other things um, at Uncanny and Fireside and the Beneath Ceaseless Skies and here and there and everywhere. And I love world building. It's my one of my favorite things to do. Um, and not all of it ever makes it into the story. And that's what I love. And that's like, anyway, it's it's a lot of fun. And I'm really happy to be here today. And if I kind of um, look off or, or launch away, I'm pandemic parenting today. So I will be back as soon as possible. Well, great. Thank you, everybody. And thank, every, thank you all our uh, participants in the audience for, for coming today. Um, so let's start off. This is a panel on too much world building. It asks the question, so what is too much world building? Is there such a thing or is it a matter of taste by the writer or the reader? 
Um, Karen, why don't we start with you? There is such a thing as too much world building for the reader, not for the writer. I don't think writers can do too much world building. <laughs> it's all about um, how much of it, for me, it's all about how much of it makes it into your book. Um, like for example, if it, it's it's all about what's important for the story, it's all about what's important for the character and the character's life, I think. Um, I know whenever I do, um, I write primarily science fiction right now um, and most of my science fiction is character-based and doesn't have to do with like FTL drives or stuff. But you know, so they get from place to place in an FTL drive. Um, I know how it works, but the reader doesn't really have to if that's not what we're doing. Okay, great. How about um, from some of the fantasy folks? Um, Sarah Beth? Sure, I, I can chime in. Um, one of my favorite writing quotes is from Stephen King. I wrote it down so I'd remember it. Belief and reader absorption come in the details. An overturned tricycle in the gutter of an abandoned neighborhood can stand for everything. So for, for me, the process of world building involves figuring out what are the details that will bring the world to life the most vividly in, in the mind of the reader. So you start out and you have all these different details and then it's a matter of choosing which ones are, are going to spark a bigger image in the reader's head, if that makes sense. Who wants to Here with that. jump up there, Josh? Yeah, um, I totally agree with Sarah Beth. Um, you know, you want to have in your head as a writer, you want to have a vision of the entire world and, and you have lots of details and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, you have to really pick and choose what you show the reader. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the requirements for what you want to show the reader is, you know, you obviously have to show them anything that's uh, necessary for the plot, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, you got to tell them the rules of the particular plot. But if there's a rule that you know about and it doesn't have anything to do with the plot and doesn't have anything to do with uh, character arcs or anything like that, then you're probably not going to mention it. Um, even though you know it, um, maybe it shows up in like one sentence somewhere, but you don't want to make a big deal about it um, if it's not going to have an active uh, role in the story itself. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention about the world building is you need to, especially if you're writing like third person limited, um, you need to think about what your character is going to notice about the world. Um, and that's what the character is going to put on the page. So, you know, if, if the character is a woodworker, when the character walks in the room, they're probably going to notice, you know, really fine woodwork and stuff like that. And so you're, what you mention, what you bring out in the world, um, obviously has to do with the plot, but I think you also need to frame it around what your character is going to notice uh, as well. So there's a, there's a lot going on with world building besides just, you know, writing a, out a lot of detailed notes about <laughs> how your world works. And also um, on the world building side of things, I think, at least for me, one of the challenges is that I tend to come up with a world before I come up with the characters. And so I'll come up with a situation and like the way everything works before I actually know who's in it and what's going on. Um, and for sh writing short stories, that can be a challenge because like no one needs all those details in a short story that's only a thousand or 5,000 words. Like, yeah, you can weave them in there, but um, you have to, it, I like how you, Joshua, how you mentioned the, um, the, having to focus on the character's perspective and what the character would see because that is um, how I'm able to stay sane when trying to do drafting and edits for short stories in particular. Um, I feel like with novels you have a bit more leeway to weave those things in but you still don't want to go overboard um, unless you want to do Tolkien-esque info dumps and <laughs> that is something I try to steer clear of because then I get bored while I'm writing when I realize that I'm info dumping and it's like, oh, it's time to go on to the next section because I don't, I'm losing steam here. I can tell I'm bogging myself down. Do you, do you find that um, things come to you fully formed or like, how do you start that world building process? Um, you, you spoke a little bit about that, Monica. Um, I'd be curious to hear like how, how people start. And Joshua mentioned that uh, he seemed to be talking from a fully formed you know, baked cake in a way. 
Um, that I'll, makes sense. Oh like, yeah, it makes yeah. sense. I'll I'll go first since I like teed okay. that off. Yes. I guess. Uh huh. Um, I sometimes it's just like like legit. I just had a crazy dream and the world was insane and I want that to be real. Um, sometimes it's a uh, you're looking at something and being like, oh, what if what if water towers were mobile herds and like that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes it's like the opening, like the opening scene just kind of like gets in my head. I'm like, how, okay, so what is this, this scene and where are the people in the scene and what, are, what's happening? Like why, what's affected by that? What does this scene affect about, um, their lives? How are they affected by whatever is going on? Um, and where are the conflicts? Because there's always conflicts. If you have a really cool looking place and a really cool world, where does the conflict come in and who are the people and what are they affected by and why? Yeah, for me, yeah. yeah, the same thing for me of conflict. It's also for um, things that, you know, forces, I look first for forces that work on the character, um, social forces, economic forces, um, right down to what they eat and what they drink and like what store are they going to go to, um, you know, who has power in their life. Um, anything that is going to sort of like work on the character, even not in the story, but not even in the story, because some of the times you're gonna come up with all of this cool world building that just doesn't have a role, but it has like maybe a tiny little role in what they put on in the morning. And that's enough because it, it makes your world a more rounded place. Um, but yeah, I like, I like forces working on the characters and starting there. My, my favorite thing to do with world building is to start with one decision. Like just one thing that's weird about the world that like there's bone magic or monster raising or the one bloodthirsty nature spirits, like one little decision and then start asking it questions. If this were true, what would the impact be on how they live? Like with, okay, bloodthirsty nature spirits, there's these out of control nature spirits. So how does that affect the world? Well, the trees would be super tall and the mountains would be enormous and the glaciers are huge. Okay, if that's true, where do people live? Okay, they live halfway up the tree. How do they get around? All right, there's bridges, there's little like zip lines. And you chase it down through all the different aspects of, of the world down to like, you know, what people wear, how they react. And I love doing it this way because it creates a, an organic world where all the pieces um, feel natural, feel like they belong together and, and they, they cling together. So I, I do that a lot with, with creating my worlds. Um, sometimes I just, I will start, I'll open a Word doc and I'll write things I think are awesome and then put a big monster list of things I think are really cool and I'll pluck one out and maybe I'll ram it against another one and then just start asking questions and you can grow a whole book out of that. Yeah, I, I think what Sarah just said is hilarious. And I also think it's hilarious you think I have a fledged world when I sit down and start writing because <laughs> I'm, I'm a total pantser when it comes to writing. So I usually sit down and I have a really vague kind of idea of the world and the plot and, and often even the characters in the story. And then, then um, I'm basically doing what Sarah just said, except I'm doing it as I so, you know, I start with the character and like, a, you know, in the world somewhere. And then it's, as I write, I am building the world and, and basically answering all those questions that Sarah was saying, you know. So I'm saying, you know, like, okay, like my ley lines. Uh, so the worlds run on ley lines. My main character can manipulate the ley. And so she starts off and that's her job. She manipulates the lay. And then, and then I just branch off from there and, and ask myself, you know, what can go wrong? And, and, uh, and like Sarah said, you know, how are people going to actually live? Like how, how do they, if they're in a city, because I wanted that to be more modern, I'm like, you know, do they have lay stoves? Is there a lay subway? Is that, you know, <laughs> so I just start branching off from that and, uh, and I'm answering the question as I write the story. Um, and occasionally I have to break away, like uh, for my well, I had to break away and do research on like uh, uh, wagon trains and, and how wagons work because I had no clue. Um, but, and I just ran up against it. And uh, so I had to 
research on that ahead of time, but I'm, I'm very much a, a, an exploratory world writer. <laughs> uh, and I, I only research things when I run up as I'm writing. Um, and, uh, and, and I just pretend like I'm the character and I'm figuring out how this world works as I go along. I really you know, liked the... how you, uh, sorry. No, go um, ahead. I really liked how you mentioned uh, you like to look at what could go wrong. Like, how can these things go wrong? Because I think that a lot of world building comes from having a decision or an idea like Sarah Beth mentioned, and then uh, extrapolating out, okay, so you, this is a thing, but what happens when this thing goes terribly wrong or uh, someone makes a, the wrong decision about how to manage that bone magic or something like that? So a lot of your um, a lot of your responses make me want to know about um, you know I know that the hard writing really comes in when it's a re when you're into the rewriting you know after you get that wonderful first draft you've romped down to the end and now you've got to start you know with the real blood sweat and tears and um, you know does does the world building world building stop at that point or does it continue and uh, how do you manage that is that the place where you add more or cut. I kind of laughed when you said wonderful first draft because I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, it's not. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> I find first draft the most difficult part of it because before you begin, it's this perfect shiny thing. And then you put words down and you're like, oh, that's not so perfect shiny anymore. So I actually Fair love enough. revisions. I do like 20 to 30 revisions per book. Um, and for me, the world building is completely continuing during that process. Um, I will outline between drafts. I will... Um, do more. I always have like a rules of magic list of, um, and like Joshua said, I'm I'm exploring as I'm writing. So, I mean, my my revision technique is keep the stuff that's cool and awesome and ditch the rest. <laughs> so I'm continually world building as I'm writing, and that's one of the fun parts is um, the revision stage is where you bring it to life. So. Anybody else? I, 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 you do. Want to hear 30 tracks per yeah. book. That is insane. I, I can't that even. Oh my heavens. <laughs> Some people um, rewrite as they're writing, you know, <laughs> so they don't have much to do at the end. I mean, it's it's a matter of uh, you know personal preference. I, I'm more like 10 and I thought that was a lot. I like to put a lot of stuff in because you can always cut. Like you can literally always cut. That's something that can always happen. It's, and, and I find, I, I mean, I find cutting fun. I like, I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm used to writing to um, like a thousand words or 300 words or 600 words. And I really, really, so cutting is fun for me. So I'll go in and see how much I can cut um, and, and still make it look pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so. Um, I, 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 I am high because if you put a lot in during your first draft, don't really like think. <laughs> I'm trying, folks. I'm trying. <laughs> like <laughs> you're doing great, Karen. <laughs> if you um, if you uh, if you put a lot in your first draft, like I used to feel really annoyed <laughs> that I would put a lot in my first draft because um, I would, you know, it was a lot more work, but um, <laughs> it's fun. Cutting is fun. Try it. Because um, it, yeah, I can't get a sentence out. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I was going to say that, that you have to figure out what works for you as a writer. Because um, I, like, I, my first draft is usually pretty clean. And so when I'm revising, um, I, I'm usually adding. And what I'm adding is things that now that I know the full story and I know exactly where it's going and I can go back and say, okay, I need to flesh out this rule of the world a little more because it actually became important. You know, I, I thought it was not. And by the end I was like, oh crap, you know, the whole story, you know, hinges on one thing and, that I mentioned at once in chapter two. Uh, so, you know, I go back and I, I'll build that up uh, and make that more important. And then of course there is some cutting because um, you go back and you say, well, I had this whole subplot that went nowhere. So, uh, so let's cut that subplot out and stuff. Um, but I, I know lots of, of writers that like, for example, um, I believe Kate Elliott, she did this. And I know Gerald Brandt just recently said that he did this where he writes 
and he doesn't really do any description or any of the hardcore world building as he's playing he does that during the revision. Um, I don't know how that works. I can't do it that way. <laughs> Um, I mean, the description and exploring the world is kind of the whole point of me writing in place. So I'm doing all of that as I write. So usually, worst case scenario, I'm cutting things, like Karen said. I'm going back saying, you know, I just spent five paragraphs to this thing. I need to get it down to one, uh, something like that. Um, and part of it depends on your editor, too, like if you've sold the story. Um, DAW uh, editors are no for saying we want more, we want more, we want more. <laughs> so often when I'm revising for my editor, I'm going through and saying, okay, I got, I got to, she wants me to build up aspect of the world a little bit more. So, uh, so sometimes it's a request from someone else. I did want to mention that it seems to me that the trend is now to write tighter, less, uh, involved world building stories whereas you know 20 years ago we wanted the mega thick volume where we told everything there possibly was about the world so i think there's also a a reader shift going on uh, that kind of dictates how much world building you can and get away with it <laughs> well you can still keep the world building you just gotta like shove it in under the hood a little bit here and there <laughs> <laughs> which is fun for me um for for my first draft of the this novel that i'm editing um it was i ended up throwing out almost all of the first draft except for like one scene where i then took those characters and in future drafts turned them into the primary focus of the novel um and it was i've like i've got plenty of stuff saved in another document now it's like oh this will be a separate magic system because I already have two different types of teleportation and I have a failing oligarchy and we don't need to have all of these extra characters and other things that detract from the main focus of this story's plot. I am, um, I actually, well, I do love cutting things, but I, I, I adore dialogue. So I'll sometimes write scenes where the characters are just bantering away, bantering away, and then I use brackets a lot to leave myself notes. I'll put a bracket like they need to be somewhere or like something needs to be happening. They can't just be like snarking their way through a whole scene. I love, but they need to be doing something. <laughs> so I think that this, um, we've all been sort of saying, and I'm going to flat out say, you don't have to know everything when you start out. It's cool if you do, but you don't also, you also want to be careful of not falling down that rabbit hole of building this beautiful, beautiful world with all these details that you know, like how the plumbing works and everything. And then you never tell the story. Because if you don't tell the story, no one's gonna get to enjoy this beautiful world that, that you've created. So sometimes you do need to just stop with the world building, tell the story and figure out the stuff later. And that's completely fine. Um, you can do the world building at any stage of the process. And it needs to happen at some point. <laughs> but any stage is fine. There's no rules on that. Are there are there different ways to do world building or are there different um you know different levels of genre like or science fiction fantasy horror um or, or flash are there different different requirements for world building and all of those as many as there are writers <laughs> good answer <laughs> <laughs> like i um it, a lot of it depends on how much of the nitty-gritty you know you want to you want to get into and what kind of story you're telling like um like my books are really fast um one of the things we did was um as, as joshua said one of the things we did in editing them was take out take out take out make it faster make it faster and just when i thought i couldn't make it faster i discovered that i could which was fun because i had to take out some of the little details and find different ways of um showing them but um it's all about how detailed you want to get because um, you can do like hard science fiction and you can get in there and go, okay, like I have to learn exactly how like an Alcubierre drive works because uh, otherwise, you know, nothing else works. I mean, Andy Weir does that with the Martian um, or you can be Star Wars 
and go, hey, I have a lightsaber. I don't know how it works, but oh, look, a kyber crystal. You know, it's it's it works. It's 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 the science of the it's the science of the world. The kyber crystal powers the lightsaber. Um, as long as it's internally consistent, um, it doesn't really even matter um, kind of where you are in the spectrum as long as your work works with itself. Excuse me. Yeah, um, I, I think it also de depends on style, voice, and the age that you're writing for. Um, I write books for, for all ages. When you write for kids, it's often going to be the first time they've encountered this concept, the first time they've gone with you on a quest, the first time they've walked into a parallel universe, the first talking animal they've ever bonded with. And so you have to explain in a way that you don't when you're writing for an adult reader. When you're writing for an adult reader, you're dealing with a different set of issues in that they come with all sorts of expectations for what way you're going to do. And you have to make the choice whether you're gonna fulfill those expectations or subvert them, both of which are super fun to do. Um, so there should be an awareness of, of the style, um, the audience, the voice, and most importantly, the story. Because that, that's what all the world building is serving. It's all about telling a story. So you, you should be asking yourself questions. Each, each detail you decide to share, is this crafting a world and a story and taking the reader someplace? I think uh, one strategy that might help writers is to consider the world as a character. Like when you're writing your character, you're trying to keep the story focus on that character for the world building in a lot of ways the world is that secondary character or even it's a, a silent main character hanging out in there that your characters are exploring um and if you look at it like i'm just thinking about like how when i'm editing i have to edit down uh sometimes the characters are just like having unnecessary dialogue that doesn't really move the plot forward um with the world building when you think about like okay the world's a character would this is the consistency in there it's like would a character make these decisions is this rule in the world with how the magic work is it staying consistent throughout or is this technology being consistently pre presented and used by people and, and if not what's the logic behind it it's just like having a character where you need to justify if, it, if suddenly in the plot the character is making this decision that um doesn't jive with what they've been doing before like you're gonna have to really justify that to your readers um, the same thing goes with world building because you will have those readers who will be like, this is not technically correct within your world. And can you explain why, please? And speaking of readers, can we flip this around a little bit? For, and uh, from a reader's perspective, um, you know, what is too much world building? Do you, is, is there a, a different definition um, for, for readers? Again, it's probably preference, but I'd like to hear what you all might think about it. Anybody want to jump on that? I'm, I'm a total skim reader. So I tend okay. to like read to the dialogue and then like discover later the dialogue, oh, somebody died. Whoops, I go back. <laughs> so it blocks the text I currently use it for. <laughs> As a reader, for me, it's the asides sometimes. And this is a perf, this is a, completely personal preference everybody has them um but when you're in a scene and then the author ducks out to say oh and by the way they were eating duck soup and this is the best duck soup in the area and this is how it's made and the um and the scene is about um and the scene is about uh like talking over politics or something um so the asides are not something I can, I can, I really enjoy. Yeah, it's all the hilarious like footnote ones. Like I love that. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it does depend on the author's style too, because like some of those footnotes are really distracting for certain authors' styles. Um, and that's like, okay, this is a little bit excessive. Uh, maybe pull that into a separate like novella or book about the world like a little how-to guide kind of thing that you could then publish to share with your readers who are really into that world but like hitchhiker's guide is it hitchhiker's guide do they do footnotes i know terry pratchett like masterful use of footnotes masterful i i think a lot of it is is uh, reader preference though i mean if if uh if a reader picks up a book and there's 
and they're not interested in all of the backstory and you know history of the world and all that kind of stuff and you have that all in there then that reader is probably not going to pick up your second book um so i mean i, I think the readers are kind of self-selecting uh, by choosing their favorite authors in that sense um but i totally agree that it that you know it, you as a writer, you have to develop your own style and you should be writing to what style you prefer. I mean, you can't, there's no way that you're going to be able to write and include the world building that every reader wants. You're not going to be able to cover everybody. So, you know, you, you should make yourself happy <laughs> as a writer uh, with how much world building you want in there and, uh, and then work from there. Yeah, I think that that what Joshua just said is so hugely important. I mean, you always hear the adage, um, write what you know, but I really think it should be write what you love. Write the book that you want to read. Here, here. So I uh, I wanted to ask um, uh, Monica a question. Monica, I know you write poetry, and I'm wondering if world building and poetry is uh, a, a similar kind of thing or is it different or is poetry wa raw world building all in itself and then we can open it up to the rest if the other had comments that's a very good question um i think it depends on the type of poetry um because when you if you, especially if you're writing speculative poetry there there tend to be a lot more poems that are uh, like a story encapsulated in those few lines with just very vivid word choices and um, verbs and just like every word packs a punch. Um, so you, you're, there, so the speculative poetry, there tends to be world building in there. Sometimes you're exploring as you're, like I tend to do more explore as I'm writing a poem and just like figure out in the, in the drafting process and the revision process, what words work and what conveys the images I'm trying to show the reader while I'm telling them um, like a story or a snippet um, for, I, and I've, I've actually, I ended up joining the science, science fiction poetry association because I was finding that my, what I define as speculative poetry isn't necessarily what other people consider, like in the genre fiction world, tend to consider speculative poetry. And I found it very fascinating how some, some poets do the same kind of strategy I do, or they seem to based on what their finished poems look like. And then there are some who set out with like, I want to tell a story in this world. And it is just like a story with the rhyming or the poetic structure, the traditional poetic structures. Um, I think some of my favorite speculative poetry techniques that I haven't tried it yet are the mirror poems where you can you read them and they can be read from top to bottom bottom to top left to right or like that second column can be read first and then the left column with like the original column can be read first um, and there's a lot of world building that goes into that because you have to but it's more like I think it's just more, much more precision in language um, which is just like, very, it's very fascinating. Um, does that answer your question? I can try to rephrase or- Oh yeah, that's clear. fascinating, okay. yes. Anyone else wanna comment on that before we open it up to some questions on the floor? I just think that mirror poetry sounds really hard. Yeah, yeah, it's it does. crazy. It it's, yeah, I haven't it's, heard of that before. Yeah, there's, um, if, I'd have to pull out my issues of Starline, but they there's usually um, some poetry issues or uh, about one per issue or every other issue. There's at least one solid mirror poem in there. So hot. Starline. It seems really yes. hard. Okay. okay. <clears throat> I have to check that out. So um, we have a few questions um, that are up in the Q and A. Um, let me bring this down here. Um, Brandon Sanderson once stated in a Writing Excuses podcast that a writer should explain the heck out of one thing and then you can gloss over others and the reader would believe you know everything about the world. Uh, do you agree with that statement? And is it a good one to keep in mind? I actually kind of love that. I hadn't heard that quote before. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. I believe that you can buy yourself a certain amount of impossible with a certain amount of real. Um, the more concrete details that feel really solid, 
you can have in your world, the more you can get away with awesome things happening that could never possible. Um, it, it's all about making this promise to the reader that, that you're not lying to them, um, that you're, you're casting the spell um, and you don't wanna do anything that breaks that spell because then they stop turning pages and that would be very sad for everyone involved. Um, so I think there, I don't know if that's true all the time, but it, you can certainly approach it that way. You don't have to know everything, but you have to be confident in what you do know and what you do present to the reader. And, and it should hang together and feel true. I think that's it. Yeah, it, it has to feel true. It doesn't have to, to be factual, but it has to feel true. I, th I think you have to have there has to be that scaffolding that is well established that you are prepared to argue out until the person like who's nitpicking your logic behind it. You have to be able to argue that out with to the point where they're satisfied or till they get tired of arguing with you about it because they, they realize like, oh, you've thought about this and this and this and this. And then you can, and, but like, so like for me, I have the two different types of teleportation. So I have, I can go on about how each one works, why each one's different, what the rules are, what, like how they each evolved. And like, that's not necessary to show the reader entire, like all those details and all those explanations. You don't necessarily need that when you're reading it. Um, but I am prepared to argue that to other editors, to readers, <laughs> but that also, but that's like all that detail is there and people don't question the fact that there's teleportation or they don't question um, some of the other aspects of that society um, as a result of like, okay, this mechanism has been really well thought out um, and it's being presented in a believable way and the characters aren't treating it as some outside uh, abnormal thing. It's just something that their lives have to deal with. Yeah, I think what, what Sanderson's uh, trying to say there is that the actual physical writing that goes the book, you have to have enough there that when your character is running down the street and decides to turn right, that the reader is convinced that you will, that you, as the writer, know what would have happened if they had turned left instead. And so I think Sanderson is trying to say you have to put enough into the book to get that feeling across. Like Sarah said, you got to be convincing. <laughs> And as long as you're convincing, then then yeah, you don't need to say what ha what what on the street to the left, um, because you know they turned right, and so that's not going to be relevant to the plot. But you have to have enough there that the reader is convinced there was something to the left. <laughs> and well, it was internally consistent if... with what is with, with what was on the right. <laughs> that too. Hemingway once said that um, you know you can you can write about anything, but you can leave out anything as long as you know it's there. The reader will the reader will intuit it. So I always thought that that was very interesting and very true. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's better not to describe what the monster looks like because then it's scarier. It's much scarier. <laughs> sure. We have another. Oh, go ahead. To say like Jaws, the movie Jaws, you don't see. Yeah, you got the dark until you got the end. music. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we have a, another question related to world building. How much backstory do you create for characters, protagonists, antagonists, minor characters, uh, before you start to write? Do you need to have the antagonist's entire life story in your head before you begin a draft, for example? I'll, I will jump in real fast on that one because I think I've yeah. got a pretty short answer. Um, I do a lot better when I don't have that all figured out. Like when I have the situation, the character and their situation that they're in and the problem that they're facing, I will start writing. Um, if I, I used to try to do the, um, the character sheets and like have all that stuff planned out in advance. And I would just end up uh, tiring myself out because I'd come up with all these details and all this backstory and then I had lost my forward momentum for actually writing the story. The, the only thing I figure out is for every character in there that has a speaking role, I write down their name <laughs> and I write down um, what they most want in the entire world and what they most fear. And really that's, that's all you really need is that like core thing. And whenever I get lost on the character, I come back to that want and fear and, and it propels them forward. Um, 
unless I'm writing my book about with like lots of talking animals and then I have to decide like which kind of animal they are and how much fur they have and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> and I am here to assure everyone in the audience who is like, I don't know any of this stuff that um, it's okay if you don't. Okay, honey. Um, it's okay if you don't because um, I didn't know who the antagonist was in Architects of Memory until I finished with the first draft. I wrote it as like a as like a people versus space, like man versus environment story. Um, and it was missing something. And I'm like, okay, what is it? And then I looked at the story and I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, it's X, it's person yeah. X. <laughs> so you can you so sometimes you just need to do the writing to to figure it out and that's the fun part really yeah i i would say i don't i i don't have anything on the backstory of the characters uh figured out ahead of time because i'm exploring and i like those moments of writing and all of a sudden this character starts telling this other character about their past and i'm like holy shit i didn't know any of this you know, I was like, okay, uh, you know, and it just, for me, that, that's kind of the point of writing is, is I like those moments. I'm, I'm writing for those moments uh, where I'm surprised by uh, the character in my back brain it, it has uh, figured out or come up with and uh, is now deciding to uh, reveal to me. So, uh, so no, I don't have any of that kind of stuff figured out ahead of time. It, do, it does come... In, in the writing. I mean, I always approach it that obviously every character does have a backstory and that the world itself has a backstory. I love layering and the folklore and the legends and the history of the world itself. Um, I think it was Monica that was saying that you, you can treat your world as if it's a character. Well, the world has a backstory too. Um, speaking of um, that, do, do the physical characteristics of your world affect your writing? Um, if, for example, the world has the opposite rotation of Earth's, um, so the sun rises in the west, sets in the east, um, does that, and if so, how does it affect your writing? Huge, yes, yes, huge. I mean, every, every decision you make about the world, in order for it to feel real and true, it, it should trickle down through the whole society, through the, it affects everything. I mean, just think about like alternative history. You tweak one thing, step on that butterfly and the world feels different. The same is true in secondary worlds. Whatever decisions you make are going to trickle down through its history and affect the characters and affect the story. And it's a wonderful thing because stories can arise out of those differences and out of those decisions. And it also creates uh, like the characters, the folk stories or the tales that they were told growing up. Uh, so that affects like your world building, having that one straight line detail where the sun rises on the other side. Like there's a whole mythology that can come up with that that would be possibly completely different from like what we have for earth uh, in different cultures or, and, and also like it affects the cultures, like the different cultures that you include in your world and like how they perceive those things as well. The, and it can affect your, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that, that um, there are, when you're writing, there are certain things that, uh, that will, for world building, like the, the series I'm currently writing, um, the characters don't know what the history of the world is, but of course I do. And, and the knowing that history, I, I, as the writer, am plugging in all these little hints to the reader about what the actual past of this world was. The characters are like oblivious to it because this has always been their world. And as far as they know, this is how it's always been. And uh, so, so knowing things about the past uh, of your world is definitely going to affect uh, your writing and what you're revealing and all that kind of stuff, even if the characters are totally obvious. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. I, I like how it can affect your style as a writer. Um, I'm writing a lot of claustrophobic, like man versus environment space stories, possibly because it's a pandemic and I feel like I'm trapped in my house. So <laughs> sometimes, yeah, it's funny, isn't Good it? Good for spaceships. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so spaceships. So um, 
when I'm writing those, it trickles down to what the people say. Everyone's claustrophobic. Everyone's on top of each other. Everyone's just like, you know, so they might talk a little shorter. They might talk a little um, more pointed. They might not want to have massive, huge conversations with each other. And when you do get into that lovely flowing lyrical stuff, it's more of a, it's more of a, oh, something's happening here. And you can work that into your world building and, and really make the reader notice. Um, so I really like that kind of thing. So there's a, that, that sort of begs the question that someone has put up in the Q&A also um, about like, you know, all of this world building that we've all done. Um, how do you organize all of it? How do you organize the material in your world? Do you stick it in a notebook, Excel? Do you, do you put it in a computer notes? Do you throw it in do Dropbox? I Everybody have, different... yeah, everyone's got different yeah. systems for it. I have, uh, as I'm like, just thinking about this question, I'm like, oh, I actually should maybe have like a OneNote database, but I don't even have any of the Microsoft suite. Um, I, for my novel, I have stuff organized in categories in Scrivener. And then I know I've got uh, handwritten notes, but I'm like, I'm very bad at using one single notebook. So I have to go through and compile regularly and make sure I haven't hidden details in this pile of notebooks that really need to be in my one world building notebook. Um, I do try to use tabs in like the post-it tabs so I can find things easier. Um, and I know, I think it's Staples. They have these, these notebooks where these spiral notebooks where you can remove a page and put it back in somewhere else in the notebook. And I discovered this recently and I really, I'm like, man, I think I need to do that once I, when I'm going through my next revision for this. Um, but I really like the, like the, the way my brain works, it's really nice to be able to write something and then modularly move it around into different sections or move the little section dividers around in a notebook. Yeah, I, I just have folders on my computer, one called research, one called thoughts. That's, that's it. <laughs> Does anybody I, I, use something like Scrivener or, yeah? I, yeah, I use Scrivener. Um, okay. I open up a whole thing for my, um, for my novel and I have tons of uh, different uh, different sorts of um, folders and things. And I keep the story in one side and the other side is open to whatever notes I need. So like chapter three notes, chapter four notes. Um, and I'll often just put things down like, um, oh, Natalie likes the Smash Boys or something, or she likes this song. <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> here you go, baby. Um, she I likes like your Smash PR. Boys or she likes oh. um, <laughs> something like that so that when I need it, I can come back and get it and it's in the chapter I want it to do. So yeah, Scrivener is great. The Just notebook. make sure you back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. <laughs> Yeah, I just have a moleskin notebook and I jot things down in there, um, but I have to, have to admit that I'm very good at it. <laughs> like, I usually end up putting down the name and I've got like air, uh, eye color and hair color and stuff like that in there. And, and then and then after that, like, well, I know this character said that they liked this and it was sort of in this part of the book. And then, and then I forget to put it in the notebook and then I, then I have to go look for a story and yeah it, it's the notebook is only works so far for me <laughs> but i think we're um we're winding down toward the end um and uh i wanted to to do uh some wrap up and parting comments and uh, i wanted to ask you all what are some great world building stories that you can recommend to our readers as we uh as we wind up who wants to start I'll go, I'll go, oh, uh, go ahead, Karen. Go. Okay. You go first. Um, currently, uh, uh, Arkady Martin has a great duology right out now. Um, it's called A Memory Called Empire. Um, mm -hmm. And it's got possibly the most world building I've ever seen and the most well done world building I've ever seen. Like, she just packs it in and you don't even notice. It's brilliant. Uh, I highly recommend N.K. Jemisin's Broken Kingdoms trilogy. Um, those are like the world building is absolutely gorgeous. It's very immersive. And once you start reading, it's really hard to put it down. And you don't even realize how much world building is being unpacked unless you start questioning, oh, how much world building is in here? And then you're like, oh, my gosh, so much. 
Um, I guess I'll throw in uh, the book I'm currently reading. I'm, I'm not to it, so I don't know where it's going to go. But uh, so far, the world building has been amazing. It's um, called The Velocity of Revolution by um, uh, Maresca. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. The world that he's building up and creating has been very interesting. So I'll throw that one out there. Having that moment where I'm like, what books have I read? Have I read any books? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm like looking around there. Um, I just read Light of the Midnight Stars by Rena Roster. And I thought that was one that beautifully tied um, style and voice to the world building that's done in it. Um, I also really love The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune because that was just like adorable world building. <laughs> it's just really cute oh, and charming. Um, and of course, I have to always mention The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells because they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I have a couple. Um, I'm currently reading, or we just finished Two Like the Lightning by Ada Palmer. It's crazy world building in there. Some We did a book club on it and uh, some people said it's too much and other people said well it's not enough but there are a couple more books um, I'm also reading our Katie Martin's um, um, wonderful memory um, uh, not the memory but the um, the, the empire and um, also Karen Osborne here um, the memory series is is pretty phenomenal I'm about a quarter of the way through that too Thank so you. I'm really enjoying that so and we'll get to us so um, I want to thank you all very much for um, for taking part in this. Uh, it was this is a great panel. I've loved having you all here, and I hope our uh, audience. I know our audience did as well from the the all the stuff. So I think we're just about out of time. Are we? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'll hang around a little bit in the Discord. I think we're in the St. George channel. If anyone has any after panel questions.